I'm, I'm going to hopefully take up no more than maybe 20 minutes of your time over the next um, next little while and talk a little bit about my own experience with um, lessons learned and, and how to maybe have your voice heard a little bit more as a student partner, uh, particularly in the context of research projects um, in higher education. Um, I think we do a lot of work in student staff partnership um, across the board in higher education, but maybe less of a degree in terms of research and how we actually look at the, the student journey and student experience and how we can create, uh, I suppose, opportunities for students to um, cultivate solutions and, and create better environments for, for them and their peers. Um, so first of all, I suppose, who am I? And then I, I thank you so much, Rhiannon, for the, the lovely introduction. Um, as Rhiannon said, I am a PhD student for all of my sins in the world. Um, I kind of have the, the second year PhD blues, like most people where I'm like, why am I doing this? But um, I'm a PhD student in medicine here in the University in Galway. Um, I'm studying stem cell therapeutics for neurodegeneration. But before I took on um, that PhD role, I was heavily involved in, I suppose, student um, partnership, student training, um, being um, a student representative. I was an education officer alongside a number of other part-time positions. And um, as I said, I'm also an NSTEP student trainer. Um, but the two points that I'm going to come at from this presentation is being that the student partner should lead in two different inclusive teaching and learning projects um, that were piloted in NUI Goa. And then a little bit as well from being um, a student slash patient advocate in research for those with um, chronic illnesses, specifically in my case, um, type 1 diabetes, which does have a little bit of, a, um, I suppose, an overlap into what we're going to talk about today. But the first thing that I want to do, and I know everyone hates doing um, interactive stuff, but I love doing interactive little things that we can do questions anonymously. So if you do want to just go onto another tab on your screen or into your phone and go to menti.com um, and the code 675 three nine one one six um so six seven five three nine one one six um and i'll also drop it in the chat for anyone um that might need it as well uh, i just want to get a sense of the room and a sense of people that are here so i'm going to stop sharing this so i can share the mentee with you but i, I want to get a sense of how much you think students are involved um as equal partners in research to date so the question is my institution meaningfully includes students in research it conducts on the student journey slash experience. Um, as, as I said, this is an anonymous way to, to give feedback, so no one's going to know what you've said. So I do want you to feel comfortable to be as honest as you want in your answer, whether that's that you think that your institution is great at including students in research or that your institution is maybe not so great, um, just to give a sense of where people in the room are at. Um, I also find it exciting to share the results as they're coming up so people can see. It's a little bigger for people. So we've got people kind of in the in the middle there of agree and, and don't know. And to be honest, that's kind of where I expected people to be. I kind of didn't necessarily feel that people would necessarily be very strongly agreeing or strongly disagreeing. But lots of people in the don't know category and, and to a certain extent agree. Um, and I suppose that's kind of reflective of the experience that we have within um, student partners in research that we often don't know if students are involved and often students are involved at, at certain points and, and not throughout. Um, sometimes students are involved right at the end to say, do you think this is a good research project that we did? Um, despite the fact that students had no input into it um, in the beginning. And then we also have research projects that um, we conduct that asks for student opinions and, and student feedback but hasn't once considered what a student wants to be asked. And I had this conversation with Jeffrey before about uh, feedback within class reps. But if you've never been asked what questions you want to give feedback on, how can you ever give meaningful research or meaningful data to your institution to improve your experience? So if we don't include students uh, from day one, how can we expect to get any sort of meaningful, um, I suppose, outputs or, or, or reasonable data that we can then um, use in our own institutions? So that's the first question I wanted to ask you. Um, and the second question that I wanted to ask you was, if yes, if you felt that you were included um, in your own institution, and I'm going to stop sharing this point and just let you do this in the background. Um, I want to know from your point of view, how does this happen at your institution? In what way do you think students are included in research to date? Um, and for those of you that maybe said no, or you didn't know, maybe to throw down some ideas of where you think um, students should be involved or how you would like students um, to be involved in research um, as partners in your own institution. So I'll go back to these slides now. So with that said, um, I said I would talk about two projects um, that I was a student partner from in NUI Galway. Um, and to note that these were two pilot pro projects that were undertaken 
most likely because of specific funding that was available in the institution at the time, um, but also a need for, I suppose, understanding the experience of inclusivity um, within our undergraduate and our postgraduate programs. Um, and a lot of what Weisha was saying there around uh, the staff side of it, I, I was reflecting on it. Um, every single person nearly that was involved from a staff side in these projects um, were women as well. Um, and it, it was very much, uh, we had lots of different training sessions where we invited people to come and talk about this type of research. Um, and it was kind of this idea of speaking um, to the converted or speaking, preaching at the choir, because it was 90% of the time, other women who were in staff positions um, coming to these training sessions as well. Well, the first project looked at for three years from 2018 to 2021 in our College of Business, Public Policy and Law. Um, and it looked at the inclusive learning practices of undergraduate students, both in their lectures, in the group projects, how their peers um, viewed them or how they viewed their peers, um, opportunities they felt they could or couldn't access, um, supports in terms of um, accessing maybe extra supports in their own um, course or curriculum, so on and so forth. From that project, we also noted that there was a huge need to also do a piece of work on the postgraduate experience, both at postgraduate taught and a postgraduate research level, particularly about the research level. As in, in Ireland, there's hardly any data to suggest um, levels of inclusivity or levels of exclusivity most often um, in PhD programs of, of any sort of evidence-based structure with lots of anecdotal evidence that suggests that students from minority communities um, or from different backgrounds uh, struggle more in PhD projects or, or in research projects um, than, than those that don't. Uh, but we didn't have an evidence base, particularly in any way, going for this. So we expanded slightly this project to move beyond just the College of Business, School of Policy and Law. Um, and we included the School of Mathematics, the School of Statistics um, and Applied Mathematics, and then the School of Physics, um, which sounds like a really weird mix and a bit of an eclectic mix of groups put together. Um, but the funding actually wanted those sorts of random mixes together to get an overall sense of the institution. And this was funded by the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. Um, and for the first time ever, I suppose, in, in NUI Galway, in, in a real sense of looking at inclusivity and, and diversity, um, we were looking at identifying barriers. Um, but we looked at it from, from a different perspective. We understood that the literature could tell us lots and lots about what um, overall students might have been facing um, across higher education. But that we felt that it was crucial to hear from the experiences of inclusion and exclusion from the particular disciplines or colleges and the different types of students that might make up those uh, disciplines and colleges. And also to not assume that we already knew the barriers. So a lot of the research that we looked at or a lot of the, the conversations that we might have had around um, how do we include student voices in research? Or how do we create student partnerships? We were already assuming we knew what the, the, the problems or barriers were. So we were conscious to not do that and to keep our project somewhat open-ended for, for a brief point anyways, to allow us to identify what we could actually tackle, what we couldn't tackle, um, and also what we could study and what we couldn't. Um, and to also combine quantitative and qualitative approaches. Um, and I'll come back to this in, in some of the lessons that I'll talk about that we learned through this project and the importance for this quantitative and qualitative approach. But it speaks to, to what Marcia was saying around um, how do we ensure that there is diverse representation in projects from diverse types of students without just um, creating opportunities for students who would already be involved or who are often um, the go-to people um, to get involved in different type of projects to ensure that we have voices from um, diverse groups across multiple methods of engagement. And so these two projects sought to look at these, um, I suppose, somewhat intersectional grounds, but also a quite distinct grounds um, in, in their own right. So students with disabilities, international and intercultural students, students of different genders, LGBT plus students, um, transgender students in a particular sense, mature students, um, students with caring responsibilities of any description, um, and students from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. And also one of the things that we didn't include in this, but um, came as a natural point within the research is that one of the um, campuses that we encompassed in the College of Business was a satellite campus. So we had a significant amount of students who weren't attached to the, I suppose, the, the, the general campus also being um, asked for their views about how we could make a satellite campus um, or in some ways a smaller campus um, even improve their student experience and what barriers were they facing into education. Um, so, perfect. I think I'm 
put that slide in again. So from those those projects, to go back to these target groups, we approached it in, in a number of different ways. Um, and this is what's kind of from my perspective and from my, I suppose, last three and a bit years of doing these few projects, I've come up with eight lessons that I think um, could be universally applied to improve the types of student engagement we have in student partnership with research, um, but also make it a more meaningful experience for all types of students that decide to want to get involved in a research project within their own institution, looking at improving um, experiences, improving um, access to courses, um, down to improving maybe even just how much we can pay for a cup of coffee in the student um, cafe. You know, it didn't have to be something that, obviously this is a high level project, but hopefully these lessons will be applicable to something as, as benign as a, how much do we pay for a cup of tea to how do we create meaningful change for students that face barriers to education. And so the first lesson that I'll talk about is project slash research design. And what I mean by this is that the student voice should be included in all aspects of the research design, from the initial idea to the execution of the project and sometimes the execution of the results of it afterwards. Um, and I've said here, it's hard to create impact when a project has been designed without your input. Um, and I mean this with the best of intentions that sometimes people create really important avenues to research and they have the best intentions behind it but they've not consulted with anyone that's affected by the research they're doing. Um, and so they haven't actually designed a set of questions that people want to answer. They haven't designed a set of questions that actually tackle the problems that students are facing. Um, and they haven't included um, or built in any of that trust with the student population that they're then proposing to research to say, we want to hear from you, we want you involved. Um, you'll hear the tagline a lot from different universities around the student survey of, you said we did, or you said we listened. Um, and to a certain extent that, that that's great and it's great that, that those are taglines and that's the, the culture the institutions are making, but it's also important to note that, you know, we have to think of it from the very, very beginning. I want to do a project on the barriers that students face to education. Therefore, my first step is I need to talk to students who may experience barriers to education and how do we co-design the research project together? And it's not about coming at it afterwards and saying, I've designed this project, do you know what would be great if I recruited a student partner now? And you will recruit a student partner. I have no doubt that you wouldn't, but will you recruit a student partner that faces the types of barriers that you're trying to study? Or will you recruit a student partner that, um, is someone that you would view as non-traditional to be involved in research. And I'll talk about that point a little bit on in a different lesson. But some of the tips that I, I would share with you um, around how can we create this from, from day one is around building in student reviewers to research calls. NSTEP does it, um, lots of different student organizations um, or, or organizations that provide um, insight into student partnership and staff partnership do this where there's a certain element of anything that's being applied for has to be reviewed by a student and that student reviewer is given equal weighting to say this is good, this needs to be changed or this isn't I think tackling what students need. Creating project funding calls specifically that call for student staff partnership from the beginning. So lots of, of I suppose you, you, you create a research project and you get feedback to say it would be great to have more student input in this and people go back to redesign and say okay we'll include a student partner but they haven't redesigned anything else about the project um, and sometimes I think that that's just ticking the box it's not giving an opportunity for students to really have their input heard or, or have their input listened to so creating project calls that are specifically stating from day one who's your student lead or leaders it doesn't have to just be one and I think that's another issue I have is it just being one person but who who are your student leader leaders and who are your staff leader leaders? Um, and then consider having student partners um, as a co-lead as a requirement. So sometimes we have student partners on a project of a wider team of 5, 10, 15 other people, but they're not co-leads. Um, and we're creating this uh, power dynamic again. And I saw it in my time as education officer where you'd be the only student representative on a committee of 30. Um, and you're supposed to represent, in my case, 16, 17,000 students um, to 29 other people who may not necessarily have the same views as you and you're already going into those rooms with a disadvantage. So creating that um, opportunity for co-leads um, and to I suppose let, relinquish and let go of some of that control as well of it has to be a staff that leads this because if it's staff is leading it it has more value um, and I talk about that a bit more in a different lesson that we talk about about student and staff value. The second lesson I want to talk about is research outputs. Um, and I take you back to the point I made about it's important not to assume that we already knew what the barriers were. Student participation, it often asks one to two students, um, what are the barriers that you're facing? And whilst that's great, absolutely, you might find out what the barriers that that particular student is facing or um, a, a community that that student um, identifies with, great. 
but we have so many diverse ways of, of coming to education. We have so many diverse ways of going through education. We have diverse opinions on what is good, what is bad, what we should absolutely never do again and what we should absolutely do 100% more. Um, and so it's important that we don't assume that one student is going to solve all of our questions or all of our answers for us um, and that we try not to assume that we as the maybe the, the staff or, or the people that are pushing the project know everything before we've even started it. Um, and it's about building in opportunities to create wild, wide consultations around the subject of research funding um, as a whole. We often come, I, I suppose it's the nature of research funding, you get an email to say this call's been opened, you've got four weeks to get something together um, or you've missed the deadline. Whereas I think we're, we're kind of putting the, the wrong step, wrong foot forward in the, the first instance. Um, if we want to create meaningful research opportunities for students and staff around student experiences, we need to first look at how can we do a wide consultation that isn't just the same type of survey fatigue of filling this um, questionnaire that you tell me from one to 10 how good, how well you rate this particular aspect of your education, but robust, meaningful consultation where students can come at it from a point um, that's accessible to them and in a way that makes sense to them. Um, one of the research projects that's happening in the university here at the minute is called the NUI Galway 100, where we're looking at in, in this particular iteration how um, students are communicated with via the university. And one of the things that students are asked to do is to detail how many emails they get from the university in a particular week and break that into categories of I got it from fees, from registration, from clubs, from societies, whatever it might be. But the way that you can present that back to someone in the research project is up to you. So you can write it in an email, you can push it to Excel, you can do a video, you can meet someone for a coffee and say, this is everything that's gone through. You can write it down and submit it to them. Um, and so they're creating opportunities for students to give that feedback in a way that's accessible um, and understanding the issue from their point of view, whilst not cutting off a certain proportion of students because they've only said we can do this one way. So it's important to, to be mindful of how we create that wide consultation, um, but that we ultimately understand that it's needed if we want meaningful research um, in the next number of years. The third lesson, um, and it speaks a bit about what Maisha said before, around student opportunities. Not all students want to be a project lead or a student partner or a student lead or be involved in a committee um, that looks at research or looks at anything really that's um, looking at the student journey or experience in university. Um, and sometimes we, we see this um, as a way of assuming that those types of students don't um, involved or that they have nothing to say to us or that they to tell us um, and we're assuming this because we're assuming that our opportunity to be a project lead or a student partner is the most lucrative thing that a student could want to do um, and that it's opportunistic for anyone to do it and that the opportunity um, or the accessibility to take on that role is there. Um, what often we find is that then the default representation goes to, you know, sabbatical officers. It goes to the student that's the most vocal in class. It goes to the student that will put themselves forward back to an email um, or the student that often thinks that the opportunity is for people that look or sound um, or interact with university in a way that they do. It's not to say that those students shouldn't have an opportunity either, but it's about looking at how do we create opportunities for students to engage with research and with, um, with projects that look at their own experiences and their own barriers to education in a way that feels reflective of their experience, but also reflective of maybe their confidence levels at the time or just the time that they have. Um, and so designing multiple ways of engagement um, is really important to ensure that we capture as much information as students are willing and want to tell us, um, but we're not assuming that it all comes from, from one particular aspect. Um, and so I would say this in twofold, I've, I've pushed um, two tips in here, the, the first with multiple ways of engagement, and this is mostly focusing on how we collect data. Um, and it's not just about saying that surveys are the only thing that we can do or focus groups are the only thing that we can do. Within the, the project that, that I spoke about earlier and, and inclusive learning, particularly at the postgraduate level, we found that trying to um, tackle or, or understand the experiences of some of the groups that we wanted to was difficult to do in just a survey alone. Um, and that some people felt more comfortable coming to a focus group. Some people didn't have the time to put together the, the, their thoughts into a survey, but would happily do a 45 minute interview. Um, some people just wanted to come and do an open session and say, I don't really want to give a detailed answer, but this is where my thoughts are at. Um, and one of the things around this as well is that we wanted to do focus groups in that project with each individual grant that we were looking at. Um, and at the postgraduate level, we struggled because we couldn't find enough people 
to hold an, an, an ethical focus group. Um, and the assumption at the time was made that, oh, well, maybe they don't want to, to talk to us or maybe they don't want to share their experiences. Um, and I brought up the point that maybe they don't exist in our postgraduate programs because we haven't addressed the barriers that they face at undergraduate level. Um, and maybe that's why we don't see people wanting or people being present to share their experiences. And we have to be mindful of that and to not go down to that default assumption that they simply don't want to talk to us um, and that we need to challenge ourselves on that to say, well, are we being open enough? Are we being accessible enough? Are we assuming that everyone that should be around the table is around the table? And how, if we're not, do we change that? Um, and so those are two meaningful ways that we can build that into research to create more, I suppose, equitable and accessible uh, research partnerships between students and staff um, in our institutions. The fourth lesson then is funding and payments. And sometimes this is a bit of a controversial um, point to raise with, with certain um, aspects of, of an institution, but it's important to recognize the time, the value, the expertise, maybe that your student partners and speakers, um, and sometimes you, you have a student partner and then you'll recruit other student speakers to come in and you treat them then differently, but that your student partners and speakers have the same time and value and expertise um, as anyone else on the research project um, and to adequately reimburse them for this. Um, and the one thing that always gets to me in conferences or roundtables is that you'll have a big keynote um, staff member or an or external from a company come in who will get paid to, to do um, a, a keynote address. And then you'll have a student roundtable where you expect a student leader to come in and not get paid or in certain cases, research budgets um, dictates that you can't pay them. You have to give them a one for all voucher. Um, and I don't know about, about you, but like if I push an, a number of hours of my life into preparing a talk and to coming in to giving my expertise, I don't necessarily want to find out that the person who just because they have a different title than me gets paid 200 euro and I get a 50 euro one for all voucher because we are seen to be at two different levels in our um, careers within academia. Um, and so it's an understanding that that's something that we have to challenge as students and staff in research together, that we acknowledge that if you're giving your value and your time and your expertise, that we adequately reimburse that for you. Um, and again, if the staff research team are paid to attend meetings, show to the students. The student time isn't worth less just because you don't have um, the same level of a, um, of a job title as a staff member does. Um, and I think it, it often comes back to this idea of, well, who has a degree and who doesn't? Um, and that bit kind of gets me because it's, it doesn't, it's not diminishing the fact that someone has worked very, very hard to get to where they are and the degrees that they've taken. But we want students to be involved in this because they're experts in their own student learning experience, which I've just stolen from the end step training, but that just came to me there. Um, but we want them to be involved because they, they are the people that are on the, 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 the front line of this in terms of what's going well in their courses, what isn't, what could be done better, what isn't working. Um, and so that input and that value is just as important um, as the staff saying, well, this isn't working or we can't put that in place for this reason or we need to work together to do this. So it's important to, to not note that student time isn't worth less um, in these sort of projects and in, in this sort of um, line of work. So the fifth lesson then I talk about is survey slash research fatigue. And I think any student that's on the call will probably be kind of getting ready for the fact that we're coming up to the end of a semester and every single module that you take down to every single class, to every single course will have an end of year survey that will come out to you. Um, and again, it's, it's overwhelming. Often it's the tick the box exercise um, and it doesn't necessarily create a, a huge sense of trust in the types of research or surveys that we're doing um, in terms of trying to understand the student experience. So I would say here, it's also important to look at the timing of your planned data collection. We shifted around our data collection in our two projects quite significantly because it fell during exams or it fell during holidays or it fell during particularly high assessment times or it clashed with other surveys and we didn't want to either take away from those or compete to those. Um, and so that back to that point I made in lesson two around wide consultation around what research needs are, are, are needed in your institution is important. But also I think people are scared sometimes to combine multiple projects together that are looking at the same thing. Um, we don't have to do five projects that are all looking at loosely the same idea um, and create, I suppose, opportunities for students in five different ways, but we're also asking students to contribute their time and thoughts in five different ways when we could just create robust projects that look at multiple aspects. Um, now some projects do need their own 
distinct um, research team with their own distinct resources. And that's absolutely fair. But when possible, it's okay to combine those. And then you'll see that you'll bring a much more multidisciplinary team to the table. It'll be a much more robust team that can look at the research from multiple perspectives and from multiple um, angles. And just to go back to it, look at the academic calendar of your institution. Um, they're not all the same, particularly if you're looking at satellite campuses or if you're looking at multiple campuses. There might be slightly different times of the year which are busy, more busy or less busy than others because of the nature of the campuses um, themselves. Like the satellite campus I talked about was the Shannon College of Hotel Management, which works on often a completely distinct schedule to that of, of NUI Galway itself in terms of students that aren't looking at hotel management, students that have much more time in their schedule, maybe during the day to do um, a focus group, whereas maybe the Shannon College students needed the evening. Um, and so it's important to look at that in terms of your academic calendar and how are you going to engage the types of students that you want to engage. Lesson six then is, is, is I suppose, one of the more important ones in terms of um, the student voice. Um, and this is, I suppose, on both sides of the coin, yourself as the student representative or representatives, um, and then also as the, the staff team or the, the team that's recruiting. Um, and that there's a fine balance between speaking to your own student experience and your understanding um, of the wider population that you may um, be a part of, to also being a tick box exercise for certain projects projects um, and I said this before in a, in a previous lesson it's not about you speaking for every possible student that's on your campus but you providing your own experience whilst also saying we need students from x y and z uh, group or course or um, demographic to also um, to be involved and this speaks back to that wide consultation um, and again, sometimes students are afraid to speak up and say I don't want to be the only student rep here um, and you're absolutely within your rights to say I don't want to be the only student rep here. You don't have to be the only person on the project. Um, and often you'll create a much more um, interesting and dynamic team by creating, um, you know, opportunities for more students to get involved than just one or two. So creating a robust group of student representation proportional to your institution. Um, and then it's okay to say, no, you don't have to do everything that a, a research team asks you to do as a student rep if you're not comfortable you don't have time or you want someone else to do it um, or you want to recruit someone that's much more um i suppose applicable to do whatever the task may be and i'm just conscious of from jeffy i will be two more minutes i will get through the last two uh, really quickly um so lesson seven then is power dynamics so um your role as student partner is not only just to give your experience as a student um, but it's also to understand that um, you have a, a great understanding of the tangible demands and breaking points of the student journey and that your input into solutions is often the key to the success of a research project because again if we go back to how can we answer questions about feedback if we're not um, if we're not being asked to design those questions together to get robust feedback but also how can we ask for solutions to be implemented if we're not being asked about the design of those solutions um, so ask for discussion um, around potential research outputs, approaches, dissemination to be inclusive of your role um, and ensure that your voice is uh, at meeting is, is heard, often important minuted. Sometimes minutes can get absorbed into like big blocks of text that don't necessarily delineate who said what um, and that your voice is asked for. And if it's not, feel free to speak to the chair about um, how you can go about changing that as well. And then lesson eight, so the last lesson I'll talk about um, is just around next steps. Um, and so whether your research pro project discovers 10 new research points that are, uh, you know, amazing about the student experience, or you don't really find anything new, um, it's an opportunity to talk about, well, how can we change things going forward? So how do we build on the momentum of all the people we got around the table, all the students that we potentially have hopefully got involved? And how do we then create more sustainable ways of capturing the evolving student experience so that we're not every year, every two years, every three years, going back to the same point of we're doing this research project to tackle the same types of questions that we were three years ago. How do we build this into um, the, the evolving nature of the student experience and student life? Um, and I suppose for, for sabbatical officers here, the, the tips I have is to address the cyclical and short lived pots of funding aimed at research. Um, that particularly look at the student experience. You saw a lot over COVID about loads of small pots of money to say well how did COVID affect or how have return to campus affected something um, because most institutions won't necessarily make change unless they have a big evidence-based research project to show that this will um, be beneficial or that this is needed um, and so it's about kind of saying okay we shouldn't have to keep coming back to the same points year on year out to create opportunities for this research when we can create uh, more sustainable methods of 
of um, doing or capturing um, these changes or, or this research. Um, and to ask the research team from the start, like from the very, very start, what is the purpose of this? Why do you want to do this? Because there's a big difference in, I want to do this because I think it's interesting to do, to I want to do this because I think it could have tangible benefits for the student population. Um, and you don't have to get involved in either of those projects, but it's important that you know what you're getting involved in um, before you start into a team. And so the last slide that I have is just some, some final thoughts, just to kind of bring a lot of that eight rambling lessons together for you, um, is that research needs students. Research on the, the student experience and student journey is always going to need more students than it will need um, the, 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 I suppose, the, the, the unequal um, power dynamics that are at play in more ways than one. So not just in case of um, actually being the data that, that is being collected, but also in terms of designing solutions. Trust in research is needed. Um, and so avoiding things or addressing things like survey fatigue and, and student partners um, is important. You have more power than you think, um, but more than that, you have more to contribute than you believe um, within research. Um, and we have the opportunity to create meaningful and robust research research mechanisms um, if we're, I suppose, as an institution or as institutions willing to take that journey about equitable student-staff partnership in research. Um, so, yes, thank you so much.